This is another episode of the Decoding Purpose podcast. My name is Rebecca Tapp, and in every episode of Decoding Purpose, we speak to humans of both influence and impact to explore how life's turning points help us to decode purpose and to ignite a more meaningful and purpose-driven life. Hi, I'm Katrina Webb, founder and director of New Day Leadership. New Day is known for its inspiring leadership summits and events that feature speakers and creative practitioners from around the world. Our events are attended by leaders from commercial, not-for-profit and government organisations, as well as many entrepreneurs and lifelong learners. In these times for social isolation, New Day have designed a unique six-week program of virtual leadership sessions that promise to extend on our mission to support inspired leadership for the greater good. Six weeks, six leaders, six reasons to be inspired, develop new habits, adapt to uncertainty and lead for the greater good. It starts July 1. So for more information about our amazing lineup and to register you or your team today, please visit newday.world. Welcome to another episode of the Decoding Purpose podcast. Over the last century, the rules of old power in leadership were crystal clear. To get things done or to succeed in business, the general consensus was to remain closed, authoritative and inaccessible. In short, ego is the leading principle. It's amazing how quickly the world and our ideals can change. Today, globally, we continue to be in the grips of a crisis and the shadow of power-hungry leadership strategies are being frightfully exposed. But the best part in that is it's all being called out. And at the same time, a new type of heart-centred leadership is being celebrated. So why and why now? Because right now, people need epic leadership positive leadership and influential leadership. We are experiencing a kind of collective grief all over the world and as we rebuild, we are needing space, space for our stories to be told and space for our hearts to be seen. We need healing and of all the capital in the world that matters, human capital matters the most. After all, it's in these times we realise the true value of human life. So when we consider the old rules in leadership within the context of a world in the grips of a shift in paradigm, unlike any other we have known in our lifetimes, then how do we lead and what do the new rules in leadership look like? How do we shift our ego into empathy, our loudness into deep listening, Or how do we transform our force into facilitation? How do we fundamentally create a foundation of safety in a world that feels so far away from the normal that we have always known? The burning question, how do we go about cracking the leadership code to find meaning and purpose in this brave new world? Today's guest is Alay Hunkins. He is an author and a leadership consultant who connects the science of high performance with the performing art of leadership. Over the course of his 20 plus year career, Alay has worked with tens of thousands of leaders in over 25 countries and served clients in all industries, including 42 Fortune 100 companies. He certainly walks his talk. As the author of Cracking the Leadership Code, uh, Alay unleashes in this book the secrets to building strong and courageous leaders refined during the 20 years he's worked with leaders all over the world. He believes that when you crack the code, you'll have a new operating model for organisational leadership that will help your teams thrive in today's unwritten economy. Welcome to the podcast, Alay Hunkins. It's such a pleasure to be with you here today. Thank you. Oh, and I'm so excited to be speaking to you as well. And with that in mind, I'm, I'm going to start with a question that I actually ask every single guest on the podcast. And that is whether you think that a sense of purpose is something we consciously choose or is the discovery of purpose a type of fate or destiny? 
Wow, what a great question. For me, it somewhere lives in the space between those two rather than kind of a either or. I think there's a both and to it. I think that there are things in the world that we kind of emerge and grow into. And I think in some ways, finding purpose is in some ways a process of uncovering as much as it is discovering mm. in terms of there are some seeds that probably go back. And I will say, you know, beyond even the personal, but we'll say even transpersonal, where there are seeds, whether that's culture, whether that's part of the time you're in, the family history and the stories you're a part of. You know, for me, that helps me have a much more grounded sense of purpose and meaning in my life. And then I think part of the journey of life is to reveal and discover. And then maybe when it is discovered or uncovered, then it's a process of refining it and shaping it so it can be more brilliant. Because I think that ultimately as humans on the planet, a common purpose somewhere along the way has to do with ultimately my purpose isn't about me for me. It's about me for the world, which means in essence, it's about on some level, it's about being of service in some way to the people or the community or the planet around us. So we went real deep, real quick there, Rebecca. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it, it's exactly why I start with that question. But I have to say, I really loved your framing then around the uncovering and the discovering happening, happening simultaneously. I think that's a, a a really beautiful way to frame purpose. And it's something that very much aligns with what so many of my guests have shared with me with regards to their perceptions of what purpose is, so much so that I have landed on it as being a little bit like our DNA in that it's it's something that is is deeply within who we are. And as you said, it's something that is informed by by our family, by our culture, by our genetics, all of these different things. But when we discover that DNA, it's then that we can fully express it and fully step into the potential of what that is. So um, thank you for sharing your, your thoughts with me around that. I love oh, that. Yeah. I mean, as you say that and talk about DNA, um, you may be familiar with the work of, I think his name is Bruce Lipton, the biology of belief and this whole sense of that, you know, we have these chromosomes and these genes, which obviously have been passed down to us, but that we can learn how to express those genes, mm. turn them on or turn them off through our culture. So there's this wonderful nature nurture paradox that we get to dance in the middle of as we think about the unfolding, discovering and uncovering of purpose. Wow. Well, I haven't heard of that book and I'm going to have to get you to email that to me after the show. I will. It sounds, sure. sounds yeah. amazing. So look, before moving further into today's interview, I kind of want to set up the context around this conversation. Now, you're a, a master at decoding leadership and uh, I'm clearly passionate about decoding purpose and we are conducting this interview in the context of a, a global crisis being COVID-19. Now, firstly, how, how are you and your family holding up in these crazy times? Well, thanks for asking. You know, my immediate family, I've got two kids and my wife, we're here living in the Netherlands right now. I'm an American by birth, but we've been here for almost two years. Yeah. We're fine. But sad news is uh, my father's younger sister, my Aunt Jill, who actually was my first violin teacher, went from two weeks ago being on a Zoom call perfectly healthy to she died on Monday from, from the, oh, the virus. So, so sorry so to hear that news. So this hit home really, really quickly and yeah. kind of shockingly. So the family in some ways has been... As you can imagine, it's very hard to grieve virtually in isolation. So trying to connect people, whether it's Zoom calls or whatnot, because all those rituals and things we would do to take care of ourselves have disappeared. Mm. Yeah, I mean, it's if you ha are obviously having such a deeply personal connection to the COVID-19 crisis and one that I'm sure, you know, so many of our, our listeners have also experienced, whether it be through grief, such as what you're talking about, or even knowing someone or having somebody yeah. who's been really unwell. So our hearts and, and love and light go out to all of you out there who, who are really, yes. you know, working to navigate this crisis uh, as best we can. Now, the next thing I want to dive into uh, in the framework of decoding leadership is the connection for you between purpose and leadership and why in the context of this crisis do you think that that connection, the connection between purpose and leadership, matters more so than ever before? Yeah, connection, purpose, leadership matters so much right now. Um, 
let's face it, I mean, this pandemic is basically a global collective trauma that we're all facing. And mm -hmm. in the face of trauma, you know, I'm going to simplify this, but we basically have two general responses, right? We can have post-traumatic growth or we can have post-traumatic stress and traumatic stress and traumatic growth in the midst of it as well. And so for me, the crisis is this moment, this inflection point with how are we going to respond? And purpose is that beacon of hope. It gives us some direction to work towards you know, I'm, I always find myself going back to the work of Viktor Frankl and obviously mm -hmm. his classic book, Man's Search for Meaning, and how Frankl, you know, while being in the midst of the worst imaginable, you know, Nazi concentration camp, he found some sense. He imagined himself surviving that horrific experience so that he could teach lessons about human resilience and human psychology after the war. And I think, you know, having some kind of beacon in the midst of this trauma is what allows us and energizes us to get up and really make a difference. And, you know, it's interesting. So many people are talking about, you know, the need to be productive during this crisis or, you know, Shakespeare wrote all the stuff during pandemic. And, you know, it's so easy for so many people to want to kind of stay on the, the treadmill of the usual productivity. But I think in a lot of ways, the crisis is this terrific opportunity, as horrible as it is, this opportunity to press pause on a lot of our own beliefs and our own habits and just patterns of just going, going, doing, doing, and step and reflect back and going, hey, what's what's really important to me? I can't tell you how many conversations I've had with people who are going, wow, spending this much time with my kids at home? I love this. You know, there are other people who are going, oh my gosh, I can't wait to get my kids mm. out of the house, right? But just realizing this is a point where we can question things and we also have this moment to step back and, you know, have a deeper connection with the people around us. Just like you asked me at the start of the interview, you know, how are you? Is your are is supposed to just how are you? I'm fine. How are you? Right? Those kind of social pe pleasantries where it's just a placeholder to move on. Mm. I'm finding people are much more willing to be open and authentic and vulnerable with each other because we're all facing literally life and death every day. It's it's in the atmosphere mm. and. You know, so often I think it's so easy for us as humans to take all this for granted. But as, a, as you know, as I'm experiencing with just my aunt, you know, two weeks ago, boom, and then she's gone. So there, the stakes feel higher. And of course, leadership plays into that because we always put our leaders under a microscope in general. But during times of crisis, we look to our leaders to set the tone even more so. And when I say set the tone, it's both having that hope that beacon that we talked about but it's also setting the emotional tone because let's face it we all know emotions are contagious and the emotions of our leaders are the most contagious so what do we do and we're all leaders by the way when i say leader i'm not saying you need to have a job title or a position of authority leadership is a state of mind and a state of being as why any time that you're trying to influence somebody to do something in some way that's leadership. And so we're all leaders every day. So whether it's with our families, our friends, with ourselves, we have the opportunity to set the emotional tone for how we want to move forward. And the reason that's so important is because how we feel profoundly impacts how we perform. And so if we want to achieve some sense of purpose moving forward, we want to make sure that we support the whole human underneath that. Mm. You, you make um, you made quite a few beautiful points there, but there were two that really, you know, jumped out of the microphone at me. I was going to say off the page, yeah. but out of the microphone. <laughs> um, the first one was around this idea of, you know, what I'm going to call the busyness epidemic. And in fact, the podcast I released today is about exactly this, this topic. And yeah. the fact that COVID-19 in some ways has really kind of pulled us off the busyness treadmill. And it's probably the first time in a long time where we've actually had a chance to kind of stop and go, hey, you know what, I get a chance to choose again and to maybe reconnect with what makes me happy or makes me feel joyful and have a focus on being rather than just being busy. Um, and I think that shift is maybe one of the, the silver lining moments in COVID-19. But on the flip side of that, we are in a crisis and 
we are dealing with, you know, a, a collective grief, personal grief like your aunt, but also yeah. the gr- a grief around the economy, a grief of the world as we knew it. All of those things have have entered this uh, this portal where everything's in transition. And um, I believe that as leaders, it, it is such an important time to allow space for grieving in the same way we would if we, if we lost a person, like we're all in grieving together. And, and I know you speak a lot about empathy, but having empath- empathy for that and holding a safe space for that period of time where we actually need to slow down and reflect and, and sit in the grief for a, for a period of time. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Rebecca, as you're talking about this holding space, you know, I've been thinking about that term because it's something that you're familiar with, you know, in your work. It's mm. certainly a term I use in my work. And it's funny because some people I find particularly, I'll just say kind of, and I'm, I'm going to stereotype here, <laughs> I'll put that up front, but kind of people kind of come from, from just like kind of the traditional corporate world, like holding space, that sounds very esoteric. What do you mean by that? Yeah. And so for me, what I'm, and, and I've been doing some writing on this lately too, for me, holding space, and obviously holding space is at the core of empathy. You know, when we empathize with somebody else to see their perspective and, and care and understand how they feel, we hold space for them. But in essence, what we're doing at that moment is we are basically pressing pause on our own agenda and turning over our focus and our attention to their agenda, right? Isn't that really what holding space, both not just physically, but psychically, mentally, all mm. of it, right? We're holding space. It's letting go of our own agenda. And I think right now in this crisis, there's this opportunity for leaders, for all of us, and especially leaders to press pause and go, this isn't about me. Everyone needs something different. Because yes, we're having this global pandemic. We're all in the same storm, but we're not all in the same boat. Everyone is experiencing this in different ways. The traumatic symptoms are manifesting themselves in different ways. So some people are incredibly exhausted right now. Uh, it's, it's a very usual traumatic response. Mm. Some people are able to hunker down and be more resilient and just stay focused. So as leaders, we need to be able to let go of our own agendas and particularly let go of this idea of we've got to keep going, you know, business as usual, that busyness that you talked about. You know, my my colleague, um, Tasha Yurik has got a great book called Insight, and she talks about the importance of self-awareness, which she's not the first person to write about that, but Tasha uses this wonderful phrase she talks about alarm clock moments right that in life we have these alarm clock moments these and there can be some big ones like and she calls the big ones earthquake moments they're basically you know when something big happens that just shakes you to the core so if we look at you know in the in the field of recovery they talk about addicts hitting a rock bottom moment that wake up call moment where they put them on the path towards recovery well in a lot of ways this covid crisis is that earthquake moment where we get that wake up call. And like all wake up calls, we have a choice. Do we listen to it or do we hit the snooze button? I mean, the hope is that the pandemic alarm is big enough and loud enough and reminds us to step back and really reflect on where we're going next. Because as so many people are experiencing, we're questioning a lot of the things that we took for granted. Why do we do what we do? Why do I work so hard? What am I spending my money on? So it's great to raise those levels of consciousness because Mm -hmm. let's face it, you can't change what you don't notice. And so there's this amazing experience we're having that gives people the opportunity for greater self-awareness. And if you look at all the science of behavior change, awareness is always the first step on that journey. Mm. Yeah, no, what you're saying is is poignant to this ser- series of the podcast, which I've themed around turning points, simply because I believe that uh, these turning points, whether it be by choice, but so often by crisis, uh, are exactly what catalyze purpose in our lives and um, and I think enable us to get really vulnerable and real about what ignites meaning in our lives. Yes. Yeah. Yes, for sure. And I mean, that's quite a a good segue to the next question I have. In your book, you actually have a chapter called The Story Behind the Story, which I loved. And the reason I love that is because while I think in a conversation about purpose, we can get very caught up in our our marketing why and the why that sounds good to the world, the one that we, you know, that we tell ourselves is usually built upon, you know, our core drivers and it can come from a very deep and more vulnerable space within ourselves. Uh, What I would call the vulnerable why or what 
you have called the story behind the story. I know that some part of that story for you was stemmed uh, in a somewhat challenging childhood. How did your relationship with your mother and your grandmother influence your life purpose? Sure, happy to. So I just, for our listeners, I just want to share some of that story. So yeah, I had a very unique childhood at the time. Of course, I thought it was normal because that's all I knew. Yeah. But the unique, so I, yeah, I was raised by my single mom. My parents divorced when I was one and I was raised by my mother and my grandmother. Now that part's not particularly unique. The unique part is that both my mother and my grandmother are Holocaust survivors. My mother's born in 1935 in Belgium and war broke out in 1939 and Belgium was invaded in 41, 42, and from 42 until the end of the war in 45. So for three years, my mother was actually separated and put in hiding, and she lived through the Belgian underground with foster parents. She lived uh, at a convent. She was moved from place to place. She was had her hair dyed blonde. She was given a fake name. And you can imagine, she's just from the age of seven to 10, what that experience was like for mm. her, and then imagine what that experience was like for her mother. Her mother, my grandmother, was arrested and actually was put in the holding camp in a city called Mechelen between Antwerp and Brussels. And she was, I've seen the documents, she was actually number 181 on the list to go on the next troop train to Auschwitz. And that train never left. She was liberated from there. So amazingly, they both survived. Pretty much everyone else in the family was killed. But they were reunited after the war. As you can imagine, Rebecca, that experience profoundly shaped their view of the world. So mm. we think about things like trust. You know, I grew up in a house where literally I was told, don't tell anyone anything unless they ask for it, because that's the world they came from. And that whole experience and the culture of my family, that was my first organization. And my grandmother, really, she would vacillate. Some days she would be completely quiet, and some days she would be just angry and just raging. And I never knew who would show up on one particular day. Mm. And that experience at home is also fairly gloomy. And then I'd go to school. I grew up in the 1970s in New York City, going to public school. So I had this experience with my friends and family and their families and everything just felt so different. And so early on, I started asking these questions of purpose of, you know, why do people do what they do? Why is it that some people seem to be happy and other people don't? And realizing that stories shape our lives and our behavior and that behavior shapes the culture. And then we in turn impact people around them. And if I look at how that thread has carried through, I was always interested in psychology. I was a minor in psychology in college. I also was really interested in movies and stories and film, and then actually went on and I have a graduate degree from a drama school. I did three years in an acting conservatory where you get to really play other roles and mm. you know be characters in great dramas, as well as put yourself under the microscope in terms of your own voice. And you know, I learned different accents and body language and how you express yourself, because that those are the tools, that's the instrument of an actor. Well, mm. In a lot of ways, that's also the instrument of a leader, right? All we really have is our voice and our body. And yeah, you took the words out of my mouth as you were saying that. Yeah. And we were talking about empathy before, the empathy required to step into somebody else's character. Exactly. Yeah. Understand the world through their eyes. So so all of that really stems back to my childhood. And, and I think then my reason in some ways for going into the theater was I had this idealistic notion that when people walk away from a wonderful work of art, that they're changed, that that experience changes them. And while I think that's true, when it works like that, the actual business of it didn't feel like it was directly enough making that impact. So I switched over into education, doing uh, leadership training in schools using arts and education, which then led me to doing work in organizations. And so for me, I think my interest in group facilitation and emotional process and leadership really stems back to, you know, if I could wave a magic wand and, you know, if I could have made my grandmother and mom happier, I would. But since I wasn't able to, I guess I'm trying to help everyone else in the world. So that's, that's kind of where that comes from. Yeah. And look, in doing my, my research for this interview, I was also watching your TED Talk along with having a look through the book where you showed the audience a T-shirt that your mentor had given you, someone else who, who obviously also ignited some positive influence in your life. Yeah. Uh, on, the, on the front of the T-shirt was the word leader. And then on the back of the T-shirt was what looked like a dartboard. Um, you were exploring the idea that in leadership, we can either be a good target or a bad one. Now, 
In that same talk, you also reference research stating that overall the perception of effective leadership is, in your words, mere in mediocrity. Employees didn't seem to be showing a lot of faith in their leader's capacity. If this is what you discovered in the course of writing your book, how do you think these same leaders or, you know, even our political leaders, if you choose to go there, have, have weathered in the economic storm of COVID-19? You know, have they, have they become bad targets or good targets? Well, I think it depends on the leader, right? That's the yeah. whole question is that the target is on your back. Yeah. And the question is, are you going to be the good target or the bad target? And that really depends on the perception, right? Realizing that as leaders, we are in the perceptions business. Like, you know, I think for the most part, I'd say, you know, 95 to 99 percent of leaders wake up on a given day and they genuinely want to do a good job. Mm -hmm. None of them wake up and say, you know, today I'm going to be a lousy communicator. No one says today. I think the people on my team won't trust me today. I'm going to be mediocre. Right? No one thinks that. And yet the research shows that only about 23 percent of people globally think their leaders are effective. So the question for me is like, so why is that? Why is there such a big disconnect? And what I get to is this place where, you know, if someone asks you to take a global survey and rate the effectiveness of your leaders, they tell you it's confidential, it's anonymous. So you don't hold back. You give them the honest truth. How many of our leaders open up a space where people feel safe to give the honest truth about what they really think? The fact is, probably very few because let's face it particularly in organizations there is a power dynamic at play and we don't like to talk about power in organizations but it's very real and i know that if i speak up and i give you let's say you're my you're my direct leader rebecca if i give you honest feedback about what i really think the good the bad and the ugly and it hasn't been asked for that could potentially be a career limiting move you know and i have a salary and a, a mortgage and like i have other so i get polit you know, political. So I'm not straightforward and honest. And so what that means is leaders, because they don't get that feedback and they don't ask for it, they assume that what they intend is what people are thinking. And that is the great fallacy of leadership. And as we said before, you can't change what you don't notice. And so many leaders are, and I'll, I'll use the words of Dan Kahneman, the Nobel Prize winner, so many leaders are blind to their own blindness. Like they don't even know what they don't know. And I think you recognize this across the, the political leaders around the world. I, I love what near you, what Jacinda Ahern is doing in New Zealand, right? Mm. The, the transparency, the empathy. I mean, they've eradicated COVID from New Zealand because she made, you know, it's funny because on the one hand, she's soft and nurturing. On the other hand, she makes very strong, important decisions to mm. move things forward. But it seems like it's more about the work than about herself, right? So she benefits because the country benefits. Mm. Whereas a lot of world leaders, you know, and I don't have to name, everyone can think of some, you know, particularly from the country that I am born in, <laughs> yeah. the US, you know, you can look at those leaders and say like, what, what are your responses about? Are they really about service or are they really about self, you know, um, and, and thinking that you're going to, you know, go up in your poll numbers if you do this and that. And it's just, it just makes me sick to my stomach when I look at there's so many models of poor leadership going on right now. And it's exactly what we don't need in these times. You know, we need leaders to be exceedingly and exceptionally human right now mm. because, you know, we need the consoler in chief. We need the comforter in chief. And we need the person who listens to actual data and has a plan in place and is willing to invest in that as opposed to investing in some old cronyism and making sure that their friends are taken care of. Yeah, look, I uh, mean... Now, now I'm on my soapbox, so I'll, I'll, I'll hop off now. <laughs> no, you're good. In <laughs> fact, I, I love what you're talking about. It reminds me, um, I was listening to a podcast only a few days ago that featured a guy called Jeremy Hymans, who is the co-founder and CEO of a company called Purpose and the mm -hmm. co-author of a book called New Power. And basically he was, he was speaking on the podcast about this idea of old power versus new power. And he described old power as an authoritative currency built upon ownership in the accumulation of power versus new power, which was, as he put it, more rather than focusing on a currency of power, it was more about igniting a current, as in a current of energy or igniting a movement, um, an energy or influence that the people own rather than the authoritative leader. Now, 
I want to pick up on this idea a little bit and decode it via your experience of leadership over the last 20 years. Do you think this idea of old power versus new power is significant in becoming a more effective and focused, uh, future focused leader? Oh, completely. Oh, I, I love that you brought this up, Rebecca, because yeah, this old power, new power. Yeah, in the book, I talk about this. I call it old school leadership and new school leadership yeah. in some ways. And it's so interesting because, you know, we talked about the fact that only 23% of leaders lead well. And what, why is that? You know, they mean well, but a big piece of that has to do with so many leaders are basically operating using an industrial age playbook. It's way painfully out of date. And so part of my research is I actually went back and looked at the origins of organizational leadership. You know, it didn't just spring into the world. It hasn't been around for 20,000 years. This actually emerged relatively in the scheme of humanity recently, which was it started at the dawn of the industrial age. Before that, people worked in their homes, but suddenly you had these factories and you needed employees and you have hundreds of employees. So the question was, how are you going to organize? How are you going to lead them? How are you going to manage them? And the first people that were tasked with that answering those questions were industrial mechanical engineers, mm -hmm. people who were trained to see the world as a mechanical problem to be solved. And the grandfather of all this is a guy named Frederick Winslow Taylor. And his book called The Principles of Scientific Management was voted recently as the most influential management book of the 20th century. It was published in 1911. His work became the founding curriculum for the Harvard Business School. But basically, as you go into it, I literally had my jaw drop because he says things, and I I'll, I'll, might not get this quote word for word, but says things like, you know, the ideal worker should be so phlegmatic as to resemble the ox in their makeup more than any other type. See, back in those days, workers, 95% of them were doing manual labor on an assembly line. So it was repeated. Uh -huh. It was what we would call today brawn work or labor related. It's like manual labor. It's not thinking work. It's doing work. And so in their world, there was a very clear differentiation of tasks is that leadership did all the thinking. They were the brains and labor was the brawn. You, so basically the proposition was, I'm the boss. I tell you what to do. Your job is to shut up and do it. And what's amazing is how long that lived for. At the time, there weren't a lot of opportunities for jobs. We didn't have any kind of transparency. So I didn't have access to LinkedIn to see where there were better opportunities or Glassdoor. And so, and at the same time, there was also the value proposition that if you did a good job, shut up, kept your nose clean, kept your head down, you'd have a job for life and then maybe even get a pension. Well, those days are long gone. Yet, unfortunately, so many leaders, you know, how do we learn things in life? We learn things maybe from our parents originally and our teachers, and mostly we learn by modeling the behaviors we see. So most of us have grown up with seeing a lot of that old school leadership. And sadly, because that's what gets internalized, we turn around and start doing that because frankly, it's a lot easier from an effort point of view. We can be lazy and say, just, just do this, Rebecca, because, because, because I'm your boss. That's why, you know, mm. why do I have to do this? Because you get a paycheck. That's why, you know, which is sort of a, a, a close cousin of, you know, because I'm your daddy. That's why. And it's like, shut up. You know, you, and, yeah. and we see the power struggle in families at the same time, mm. right? It's interesting because uh, my wife, Mary, had a very clear vision. We have two kids who are now 16 and 13, but she had a very clear vision of parenting and she said she remembers viscerally being six years old and when power struggle took over she used to really feel super connected to her father and then suddenly she hit that age where he expected more of her and the connection was broken mm. and she said she refused to engage in power struggle if she was going to have kids and we talked about this before they were born and the amazing thing is and she has modeled this so i give her 99.9 percent .9 of the credit of how amazing my kids are turning out because <laughs> What it, what I notice in terms of trying to create a relationship that does not resort to power struggle is it takes infinite more patience and time to be mm. able to achieve things. However, it, you think, oh, gosh, it's going to take more time. It's an investment up front that later on pays dividends because now I have I have two teenagers and people always roll their eyes like, oh, teenagers, you know, that's going to the rebel years. Like, My kids don't have anything to rebel against because they have been treated with respect and as humans since day one. And mm. they expect to be treated like that by all adults. And in fact, my friends say, your kids are amazing. They talk to me, they look me in the eye. It's like, that's because that's how they've been treated their whole lives. So I just share that, obviously not to boast about my own parenting skills. I give my wife all the credit. Um, but just in terms of old school versus new school leadership, old school leadership put the leader at the center, whereas new school leadership 
you know, puts the work and the energy and the purpose at the center. Yeah, it's, um, I mean, for me, the link there is the difference between power over versus empowerment. Um, and yes. you can talk about that that in business or at an economic level, which we've framed, but you can also talk about that uh, in the example you just gave me of, of how you parent as well. There's, there's so many levels to that. But I yeah. also have, you know, a few other linking ideas there because one of the other things you connected in the book was the age of scarcity versus the age of abundance. And because we have been in an age of abundance, uh, there's been a lot of choice and a lot of affluence. And that's really influenced employee expectations with regards to, you know, what we want from the business businesses that we work for and from the leaders who we work for as well. So, you know, as a result, people weren't just going to work simply for a paycheck. They were able to then, you know, step into a higher potential and pursue purpose. With, you know, that's great, but within the context of COVID-19 and the economic fallout we are currently dealing with, do you think that that will change? Do you think that will threaten the rights of purpose in business or do you think it'll amplify the need for purpose uh, on the backdrop of a crisis. How would you advise leaders read that trend? Yeah, that's a great question, Rebecca. So for me, I think what's going to happen kind of post pandemic and term, and you frame this so well, is I think we're going to see a split where we're going to see some organizations and leaders and teams going, reverting back and some moving forward. So some in the sense that, you know, there's going to be some scarcity coming out of this and there's going to be people who are mm -hmm. willing to put up with a lousy organizational culture for a while because they need the paycheck. And so some of that will be tolerated in some ways longer. However, in the long term, we know that people don't stay. If, if all things being equal, if they're in a lousy culture, they will hop and jump the fence and go elsewhere as soon as another opportunity shows up. Mm. So if you're looking at actually trying to recruit, attract, retain, engage, maintain, sustain your organization with high performers long term, I mean, the only natural choice is to create a culture that's based on purpose. Because if you try to regress back to the kind of, well, you should be happy to be have a job. And, you know, if you don't want it, there are five other people out there waiting for it. I mean, you can try to pull it, but that's not going to put anyone in the best frame of mind. And again, we are not living in the industrial age where you can replace one widget maker with another widget maker after 10 minutes of training. I mean, we work in highly skilled knowledge professions. And so recognizing, you know, in the in the longer term, I, and I think this is not this is not uncommon knowledge. This has been already broadcast enough that smart leaders, smart organizations are going to be moving to wow, we need to lean into moving up the dial to becoming more purposeful, more human, mm. more empathetic, more communicative, more transparent, more vulnerable, more respectful of people. And I think, again, as people are finding, you know, so many organizations and industries have these sacred cows that because of the crisis have been slaughtered. You know, one of my clients worked in, he works in the shipping business, cargo shipping. And for generations, it was, you had to have a paper bill of lading, which is the cargo bill before you could Put one of these ships on it's amazing suddenly that sacred cow was gone within a week suddenly it's all okay to be electronic so we're going to see incredible innovation coming out of this because you know they say necessity is the mother of invention and she has been working overtime over these last months so you're going to see some amazing innovation you're going to see people having much more of a hybrid blend working from home coming into the office trying to find the best of both worlds and i think the smart leaders are going to be the ones who lean into the future as opposed to try to cling on to power and regressing in the past. Mm. But obviously, because it's a big world and the law of large numbers will show, we'll have a bell curve. Some will move forward and some will move back. So I want to talk about the brain, which seems a world away from um, from the world of economics. However, I think they're kind of linked because in some ways, both areas are talking about the difference between cultures of survival or brains of survival or those that thrive. So let's have a bit of a chat about the connection between neuroscience uh, and, and connection. So I watched your TED Talk, as I mentioned, and what I gathered from that, and please correct me, was that influential leaders 
didn't set off the reptilian part of the brain, which is that survival, fight or flight part, but they instead really allowed the space for people to feel safe, which enabled us to, uh, in terms of our neuroscience, send energy to the parts of our brain, like the limbic and the neocortex parts of the brain, that enable us to have a higher order brain function. And in doing so, that also amplifies our connection to that leader. Can you talk me through this idea so I can better understand the science of connection? Yeah, let's get into the brain. I love it. And then there's so many things. I mean, the whole field of behavioral economics has just opened up the connections between mm. our decision making and the brain and the fact that as humans, we're not these rational economic creatures, right? We don't necessarily act in our economic self interest. And that has to very much to do with our brain. So quick, quick neuroscience 101. So many people may be familiar with this of your listeners is that there's a, a, a model of the brain called the three part model of the brain. So if you think of there's three sections to it. So the oldest part or the most primitive oldest part is what we call our reptilian brain. It's our brain stem. This is what controls all of our autonomic systems. So right now, no one's having to think, okay, heart beat for me, please. Lungs breathe. Like that happens on its own. Thank goodness. Cause otherwise we would all be dead. Right? So that's, that's the oldest part of our brain. And then you've got the limbic system, which is the seat of our emotions, which also drives most of our decision-making and our behavior. And then finally, there's the newest or the neocortex. And this is the part that humans have that a lot of other mammals don't have to the same extent, which is just that's the complex part that allows us to do logic and decision making. It allows us to log on to the Internet, do crossword puzzles, ride a bicycle, things that other species can't do. Well, if we think about their cognitive resources work, that is basically brain cells are firing. We call those neuronal connections. And so these synapses and brain cells are firing. And there's a constant, like not all brain parts can fire at the same time because there's a limited capacity. Think of it like your internet, there's bandwidth. So when we are in a crisis or trauma situation, any time that we feel a threat, frankly, any kind of threat or danger, basically all the traffic gets diverted to the old parts of the brain because it knows how to respond instinctively. It reacts impulsively. So you hear a noise, what was that noise? You know, oh, I got it. Is the building on fire? Run, right? And so suddenly, and we've all had that experience, that fight or flight where the mm. adrenaline kind of runs, it comes out of your brain and goes into your body limbs because it's basically giving you more fuel so you can run like hell away from whatever the danger is. Now that's all great if you're in a fire. Unfortunately, so many of us have had the experience where our bodies have that same physiological reaction when we, let's say, for example, you what? You look at your inbox and you're like, wait, who's that email from? What? You CC'd who? Huh. And, right? and literally our bodies are having the same physiological reaction. And what happens in those moments is as all of the neuronal traffic and the blood supply goes to the physiological the limbs, what happens to your thinking brain is basically the fuel supply gets cut off. So your vision literally narrows. And Eve, I'm sure we've all had the experience where you can't think straight. Someone's told you bad news or you're in shock. You literally are in what they will call an amygdala, which is part of the limbic system, an amygdala hijack. And so a big part of what the leader needs to do is, you know, so many of us, when we describe our best leaders or what we admire in them, they use the word calm. Because what great leaders do is they calm the central nervous system of people around them. Because when we're calm and relaxed, those older parts of the brain can go, no, I'm okay. I don't need all these cells firing right now. You can go up to you, neocortex, and then we're freed up to do the more complex problem solving, creating, clarifying problems, generating ideas, developing solutions, making action plans. And when we're under stress, we just don't have the neural bandwidth to be able to do uh -huh. that higher level thinking. And so that's why leaders, you know, I work a lot with people in terms of trying to create climates of innovation. And the fact is, you can say you want people to come up with great ideas and do things new and different and change this and fix your processes and improve this and that and work with our customers. But if people don't feel safe at a neurological level, there's no way they can create those solutions because those parts of the brain are not fully online and operational. So that's really how it all plays out together. Fascinating. You know, and, and I love how neuroscience and science in general can connect to, you know, so many aspects of, in, in this, in the case of this conversation, how we influence, but even some of the ideas we were talking about between old power and, and new power. If I think about that age of scarcity that was built upon our, our old power, that was about setting off that fight or flight response that if I don't 
let this person have power, I'm going to lose my job, I'm not going to be able to survive, and it sets off all that stress response opposed to, say, a Jacinta Ardern, not that I've worked for her, I would love to, but who has clearly got an amazing team around her uh, who she is able, where she is able to hold space for the neocortex and those higher functioning parts of the brain to to be activated and to be in flow, so to speak, which enables, um, you know, employees or a team's higher potential and performance to play out. Yeah, yeah. I mean, to me, if I had to kind of boil all that down and try to give it some headlines, is that old school leader was much more around directing and this new school is much more around facilitating, right? Yeah. So facilitating the energy. And I love the word facilitate comes from the same word as facile in French. It means to make things easy. Mm. And I think the new leader is a facilitative leader. It's about how do I make things easier for people? So this whole idea of calming the biology and the nervous system is about, okay, I'm going to make things easier. So you're calm. You can do your best work. It's all about facilitating the growth of high performance and certainly purpose is a big piece within all of that. Totally. And and there's something else that that stillness can facilitate and allow and, and that is the art of deep listening, which is something that you also referenced in the book as a vital skill to create influence as a leader. Now, given some part of the conversation today is obviously focused on purpose, I think it's really important to have a chat about deep listening because for leaders who are wanting to create any kind of purpose in an organisation, I believe you need to first, uh, you know, you need to firstly begin with really listening to what an individual's purpose is. How do they, you know, tap into a sense of meaning in their lives and what makes them tip and tick? And the only way you can do that is is with the depth and listening. So with that in mind, what is deep listening? And can you talk me through the the emotional space that's required to really, really listen to someone opposed to just hearing them or hearing noise? Oh, I love this. Yeah, deep listening. To me, in some ways, what we're talking about, this deep listening is perhaps the most essential and the most human aspect. And I won't even say just of leadership, but just of humanity and relationships in general, because really at its core, what is leadership? It's, it's a relationship between a person who wants to lead and a person who chooses to follow. So for me, deep listening is that first, it starts with the willingness to recognize, you know, so many leaders fall into this fallacy that people, first of all, care what you think, are going to listen to what you say and are going to basically understand it and then just do what you do, which is such a two dimensional kind of really frankly called this an immature way to see the relationship. Whereas what deep listening flips that model is recognizing that if I want to engage, inspire, motivate, and ultimately help people take action, I need to understand where they're coming from. There's a truism and many, many coaches and facilitators and leaders use this. Uh, this and we've all heard this phrase, which is meet them where they're at. So how can you meet somewhere where they're at if you don't know where they're at? So deep listening is the gateway to meeting somebody with where they're at. And in order to do this, it's a very different type of listening than I think many people are used to. Many people are used to listening to, okay, are you done? Because now I'm going to answer. Or I have, you know, I'm I'm just going to listen till you're done and then I'm going to move on which is very passive and it's mm. just, it doesn't take as much work. Whereas deep listening is this active dynamic listening where what I'm seeking to do, the goal of deep listening is to get understanding. And my definition of understanding is, can I see reality the way you see it? Can I hear it the way you hear it? Can I feel it the way you feel it? Now, obviously I'm not you. So I can't really ever get to hundred percent because the only way I could do that was if I were you but I have to do my best, best effort to get as close to 100% as possible. And so that means asking follow-up questions, probing, noticing the body language, noticing the tone of voice, noticing what's being said, what's not being said, because I want to really have a good understanding. And that creates empathy of both the cognitive empathy of seeing the world the way you see it, but also the feeling or the emotional affective empathy Mm. of Can I feel things the way you feel them? Because that informs how you're experiencing the world. So for leaders to step into that, and I'll go back to what we talked about earlier, that holding space. Mm, I was going to bring that up because it reminded me of that. Yeah. Yeah. It's holding that space and letting go of my agenda and being so present and so aware of what's going on. 
And frankly, this is a muscle that needs to be exercised. This work is exhausting. I know if I'm facilitating a group for eight hours, I am cooked at the end of the day. And people say, but you're just holding space and just leading the conversation. Yeah, but I'm aware of all of what's going on, particularly for a group, but even one-on-one. -on -one, these are skills and muscles that need to be exercised. And the way to practice is just starting with the intention of listening with purpose. Yeah, in fact, mm. I write about the first skill of developing empathy is to listen with purpose, which is really what we're talking about, this deep listening. Yeah, absolutely. And I mean, I love there that you frame the idea of this deep listening being a practice, because in some ways, it's almost like an active meditation. If you think about the idea of meditating, it's about stilling our own thoughts and our little monkey brain and our internal chatter. But when you're deep listening, you need to still all of that in order to remove your own agenda your own pathway and all of that stuff that's going on in your head to really be able to hold that space. And that's not yeah. an easy thing to do. It's not, it's not an easy thing to do to silence your needs, your own agenda, how, you know, what's going on in your day and how you're showing up to that space to let go of all of that, to be fully present for that person. Oh, completely. And also, Rebecca, as you say that, as you mentioned about mindfulness too. Yeah. I think the two, deep listening and mindfulness go hand in hand mm. because it's really hard to hold space for somebody else if I'm so busy with my own internal chatter and thoughts. You know, one of my colleagues uses this wonderful analogy of a snow globe. So we've all seen the snow globe, the glass snow globe. Yeah. So, you know, and maybe you're familiar with this analogy is the idea is, you know, if you shake up a snow globe, it's like all the little snow flecks are everywhere. And, and that's kind of like our brains, like that monkey brains, like all these thoughts in the snow. But if you want to quiet and make the snow globe clear, what do you have to do? And that's not a trick question. Literally, you have to put it down and give it a moment of pause and rest. And so this idea for us as leaders is we need to create some kind of mindfulness practice so that we can become aware of where we are inserting ourselves into the listening conversation. And the more that we can practice mindfulness to quiet that part of ourselves down, the more open and available we can be to those around mm. us to listen deeply. And I think also being really conscious of our transitions throughout the day, because I, you know, I think a lot of CEOs and leaders out there are, are so incredibly uh, busy that it's so important to be purposeful about the transition to allow that kind of third space to, to go from, you know, that really high energy client meeting or whatever it is to then sit down and have, say, a really deep and meaningful conversation with an employee who, who might be going through a difficult circumstance. They're two very different energies and it's so important to transition and allow ourselves that pause in between to, as you, as you just mentioned, let the snow settle um, before going into that next environment. So important, mm. so important to do mm. that. Uh, yeah, transitions. And it's interesting that so many of us still, again, this is an industrial age mindset. How many of us, when we look at our daily diary, we have a 9 a.m. meeting, which ends at 10. We have a 10 a.m. meeting that starts at 10. We have a 10 a.m. meeting that ends at 11. And like there's literally no space for the transitions. And I'm a huge proponent that we need to build buffers in because buffers humanize the schedule. You know, work will expand to the time we give it. And what we end up doing is playing catch up with ourselves and our own beings as we're trying to do, do, do. And so the transition points are a chance for us to reset because you know, we talked about emotions being contagious and leaders, we are the chief energy officer. And so how do we manage other people's energy? We have to start with our own. So transitions are a really important place to do that. And for us to develop these practices where I know that if I have an important meeting, that I have a minute breathing practice that I know can take me from a really heightened emotional state to a more grounded, open, expansive. And I've had to develop that because I've needed it. Mm -hmm. And if I didn't have that, I would then be as reactive, as impulsive as anyone else. And as the leader, that hyper anxiety would start to ripple out on everyone else. Mm -hmm. I have yet to meet a single person who's talked about a leader they admired and they never, no one has ever said, you know, I had this leader and you know what I loved about them? is how stressed out they would get all the time, right? No one ever says that about their leaders. So the first place to look is in the mirror. 
So, Ale, I actually have a question that I kind of want to ask purely for selfish reasons because it's something that I'm trying to understand. If we look at this idea of purpose being simply to kind of rally around an idea or a project for the greater good, we can assume that, you know, passion and inspiration also go hand in hand with that. But I can tell you, you know, I have been to, let's just say, as an example, a charity event that, yes, it's great for the world, but maybe for me it's not aligned to my personal mission or it doesn't fire me up. And for this reason, um, you know, I think as a leader that in some ways whilst you can create shared purpose, you can't just give your people purpose. It has to come from from the inside out. Um, you know, it has to come from, as we were talking before, those personal trials, those turning points or even more significantly I think it needs to have some kind of alignment to our own personal higher potential. So what I want to understand is is whether you think that there is some kind of connection between aiming for a higher potential or as a leader facilitating an employee's potential and their experience of purpose. What a wonderful question. So for me, the word that comes up around all this is co-creation. Yeah. Right. That, you know, we can't from the outside externally impose like, here's a wonderful purpose. It's noble. Here, take Mm. it, drink it. You know, here's the Kool-Aid. Go. You know, that's not going to again, that's 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 old school leadership, even though it's around purpose. It's still very old school. Like I'm telling you what you need to do. And we know that adults particularly want to be self-directed. So if we're looking to co-create a shared sense of purpose, going back to deep listening. So are we listening and, and how, are we, how are we hearing what's important to people? It's interesting. There's been amazing work done by uh, two heroes of mine, Jim Cousins and Barry Posner, who wrote the classic book. They wrote uh, The Leadership Challenge. And they actually looked at the correlation between personal values and organizational values and then the impact on commitment that people had in the organization. And it turns out the number one driver for people to be committed to work has nothing to do with whether or not people know and can recite the values of the organization. It has to do with, are they clear on their own personal Mm. values? Mm. And so for me, to, to come back to your question, as leaders, we have to draw out of people and help them become more aware and ideally express what those values are in the organizations that we're in and that hopefully there's great alignment because you know a lot of the values hopefully overlap you know things like respect trust integrity quality passion i mean they're fairly humanistic universal values but finding your blend of that and so and 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 another thing that can help in terms of co-creating this purpose is the power of shared stories and so let's say i am a founder of a company do i share the founding story of what got me into this as opposed to people just catching me midstream? Do I share that origin story? If I'm a leader of a team and I'm not the founder, do I share what's my leadership purpose story? Like you asked me at the beginning, what's the story behind my story? So listeners now have a sense of my leadership origin story. What drives me? And then for us to turn to our people and say, what's your story? What drew you here? Why'd you apply for this work? What are you hoping to get? And to have those open, authentic, vulnerable, transparent conversations where people can connect their own personal values with the organizational values. Because when we're aligned like that, then suddenly we have this exponential multiplier where we are ignited in this shared sense of energetic passion towards achieving this purpose. And that obviously is the optimal state to move forward towards creating that purpose and moving it from vision to reality. Mm. Beautiful. I love that. Now, Ale, when we talk about purpose-driven leadership, there are words that get thrown around. Um, Now, you know, I'm an advocate for transparency and trust. And I know, as I said, having read your book, that they are things that you talk about uh, as being important in great detail. Um, And you also hear words like authenticity and also vulnerability. Um, I think Brene Brown with Dare to Lead has has enabled that idea of vulnerability to become more widely spread in leadership circles. But my question for you, is there such a thing as being too authentic or too vulnerable when in some ways we're also looking for our leaders to have a level of certainty and reassurance, especially in a crisis. This feels like a really fine line to me. So what is your advice for navigating that boundary? 
Oh, this is a terrific topic. So yeah, here's the issue with language because realize language is symbols for meaning, right? And we use, so when we use the word authenticity or transparency and vulnerable, those words mean different things to different people. And unfortunately, what ends up happening is they become these buzzwords or these shortcuts to, oh, I know what this means. And it becomes this inside outside lingo. And you know, any of these buzzwords that are held up as labels can become a crutch. And so, yes, can you be too authentic? Well, it sort of depends on how you define what does authentic mean? You know, um, I remember there was an old joke by a comedian who somebody said, where there's someone saying like, the reason I take cocaine is because it heightens your personality. And they said, yeah, but what if you're a jerk, right? So yeah. <laughs> like, Good point. the idea yeah. is like, so what, what does it mean to be my authentic self, right? And so... I think it's within, you know, what we want around authenticity and vulnerability is to use them as vehicles to be able to both be and lead from our best version of ourselves. Um, and sometimes, so yeah, and, and it's having, and part of leadership, it's the wisdom to know when do I share and when is, when am I oversharing, right? And that is why this is an art more than just a, mm. okay, uh, insert authenticity here, right? It's not a mechanistic, you know, this is a time for a dose of authenticity. You know, you have to figure out what the balance is, and which, which is why, you know, ultimately this is a very personal discovery and journey that we're on is figuring out what works. So for example, we talk about transparency, but the fact is, I don't think everyone wants to be copied on every single email from every single person. Right? You, you would drown in that. So what does transparency really mean? You know, what is the essence? What's the spirit of it? And then how do we apply it? And I think this comes back to having clarity of values. Mm -hmm. You know, so if I'm operating from the belief that people should be trusted just as a core essence, I'm going to be, a, I'm going to have a different type and I'm going to have a different relationship to transparency than I am of you know, don't share anything unless people ask for it, like my grandmother did, right? So I think you, the question, I wish I could give you a simpler answer. No, <laughs> I no, I think it's, it's fabulous. We, we need, to, we need to have that subtlety because, yeah. yeah, people say I'm, but they are being authentic. Well, you're an authentic jerk, right? Or, you know, I, I'm sure we've all heard people say, look, I just have to be honest with you. Well, look, like honesty taken to its nth degree can step into brutality. Like mm -hmm. I'm going to give you the brutal honesty, right? because it's not been tempered with its opposing opposite, which is care. And so same thing with feedback, right? I've got some feedback for you, like, right? Feedback can be given, given with love and it can be given with malice and anything in between. So the art of leadership is knowing how to straddle that spectrum and move to the appropriate space where you need to. Mm. And I think, um, you know, again, the holding space thing comes to mind, but this idea of ego versus contribution with vulnerability, like, am I being vulnerable because I have fears and I need my emotions to overflow and I need to spill my vulnerability all over the place? Or am I being vulnerable because I am in service at the moment because this is a genuine contribution that removes my own agenda and is about facilitating an experience or a space for this particular person, this team member, this employee, whoever it is that I'm wanting to influence as a leader. Yeah. I mean, what you're saying, Rebecca, just makes me think that, you know, what you're describing there is that's, that takes maturity. Mm. That really takes maturity. And I think this is why I come back to this idea time and time again, is that the path of leadership development starts with a path of personal and self-development, mm. because I have to, as a leader, continually keep looking back in the mirror and learning about myself, because that is a journey of maturation to have the wisdom to know what to do when and how and adjust that style accordingly. So, Alay, this is a beautiful segue to my next question, which is also something that's thrown around quite a lot in conversations about purpose, and that is this idea of integrity in leadership. So now, as you've mentioned, you know, as a leader, you're the target, and that means you are the target not only for your employees, but also for shareholders and stakeholders, which means you're kind of in a constant tug of war between purpose, people, ethical decisions versus economic ones. So whilst integrity is a nice fluffy word, in action it's actually quite difficult. Uh, what would be your advice out there for leaders looking to find an alignment to integrity? Integrity is such an important part of leadership. And 
we think about it, you know, at its core, going back to something we talked about earlier, you know, it starts with self-awareness. And the first piece is, are you a leader of integrity? And, and for me, that's really defined as, am I really clear and aware of what commitments I'm making? And is what I say I'm going to do followed up by what I actually do? So it starts there. And then to think about, you know, there's all these different pulling demands, right? There's people, there's our stakeholders, there's, you know, results that we have to create. You know, I had this wonderful conversation with a leader named Matt that I write about in the book. And, and Matt is a district manager for a fast food franchise. And basically they own a hundred different restaurants and he's one of our hundred different districts. So there's actually hundreds and hundreds of restaurants. So Matt was ranked the number one top performing district manager when I met him. And I said, when you started, were you top performer? He said, no, when I started, I was like 84 out of 100. And for him, he said, the big shift was when he started, he used to put the numbers first because that's what he focused on. He would get the list and it was really easy to focus on the numbers. And he saw his role was to be the fixer, to go in and fix what was wrong. And he said, the big shift to become a high performing leader was he had to stop prioritizing the numbers. It's not that the numbers aren't important, but they shouldn't be the first thing that you look at. Because as we know, what you look at is what you pay attention to. And he said the big shift to become a high performing leader was when he started putting the people first, because he realized the numbers don't make themselves. It's the people and the work that the people do, the behaviors of the people is what results in creating those numbers. And I think for many people, particularly in the business world, we have this overused strength. We're much more comfortable with numbers and quantifying things and problem solving and analysis. It's very easy to measure, right? We can measure profit, we can measure stockholder return, where it's a lot harder to measure things like, how trusting were you in this conversation? And so recognizing that if we start to put people before the numbers, we're actually then reprioritizing in things that are both more sustainable for the business long-term, but also more sustainable for the people long-term. So, Alay, you know, we're, we're living in a time where we're all visiting each other on virtual worlds. So can you tell me where we can find you uh, at your digital homes and where we can get a copy of the book? Sure, yeah. So the easiest place to find me is to go to the book's website, which is www.crackingtheleadershipcode.com, which is spelled exactly the way it sounds. And on that page, you can learn all about the book. You can order the book. You can also download the first chapter to get a preview of what the book is all about. And that will take you. That is actually part of my actual website. So you can learn about the other work that I do, the coaching and training and speaking work that I do to help grow stronger leaders. And for, certainly reach out. You can also connect with me. Uh, my social media is really LinkedIn if people want to connect with me and continue the conversation. Fantastic. Well, I know you'll be getting lots of visitors, uh, hopefully downloading the book. I certainly can attest to the fact that it was an incredible read. I loved loved every moment. Uh, thank you so much for joining me on the Decoding Purpose podcast. Thank you so much, Rebecca. It's been terrific. Thanks for joining us on the podcast. If you have enjoyed the podcast, please take a moment to leave us a review. That would be greatly appreciated. And we'd also love you to join the Purpose Movement at Instagram by following us at Decoding Purpose Podcast. Also, a big shout out to our sponsors at Supernova Sound.